Kansas City City Council business session for Friday or for Thursday, April 13, 2017 is now in session. We do have a quorum. First item of business is approval of the minutes for the business session of April 6, 2017. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Is there any additions, deletions, corrections, changes? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? There are no opposed. Minutes have passed. Second item, Buck O'Neill Bridge presentation. Uh, That's you. That is me. Mayor uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'll invite uh, Wes Minder to come forward and prepare uh, just for a couple of remarks. I think uh, it is no uh, secret um, because I think MoDOT, uh, Missouri Department of Transportation, put it out there that uh, there is an issue uh, brewing that will require some major fixing. Um, and I think that has left the city with the option of either um, fixing what we presently have or to actually look to do something better. Um, actually, MoDOT fixing what we presently well, this have. Is, or yeah, this is true. But I think as we have uh, talked about and discovered previously, uh, MoDOT hasn't figured out how to do infrastructure yet, yeah. um, which may mean uh, that we have to, um, to, to do some planning on our own. I guess what I will say, though, is today we are just trying to let people know what our issue is. And um, if I may be so bold, uh, Mr. Mayor, I may also say sure. that um, anyone who's come here today thinking that we're going to spend $110 million of geo bond to do this, um, I don't know who told them that. But today, all I want to be able to do is explain to people what our problem is. And we can't turn a blind eye to it. And I think with the presentation that is going to be given by Mr. Minder, it will suggest turning a blind eye is disastrous for this entire city. And uh, with that optimistic view of things, Mr. Mayor. Before you get any further on this whole financing deal, I don't know where that number came from, uh, but let me just say it as bluntly as I can, it's total nonsense. Uh, there is no funding mechanism in place for the Broadway or Buck O'Neill Bridge. Uh, if there is one, it will be a collaboration of state money, uh, some money from us, and hopefully federal money. None of that's been decided. Uh, the fact of the matter is there's a bunch of stuff that needs to be decided about this bridge, and those decisions haven't been made yet. So if you came thinking that somehow there was going to be a big discussion about $110 million of DO bond money for the Broadway Bridge, you've wasted your time because that has nothing to do with anything, and there's never even been a mention of that. The cost of the bridge is about $150 million, $170 million to do a new bridge. We haven't determined whether or not we can do that because we don't know what the federal funding sources are or what the state funding sources are. But it's not something that we're even close to. We heard just a new funding proposal yesterday that would have us contributing maybe $30 million. So there's a whole lot of dust in the air. I want to make sure we settle the dust before we get into the real basics of what the problem is. Uh, so wherever you heard that $110 million, let me just say that whoever passed that information on to you is flat out, ain't no doubt about it, wrong. Mm -hmm. With that, Wes Mender, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Wes Mender, uh, Innovation Engineer and City Manager's Office. Uh, just thank you for your time today. We just wanted to get uh, uh, give everyone an update on what is going on with the uh, Buck O'Neill Bridge and the I-70 North Loop study. Um, before we get going, um, I want to just call out some people just say thanks uh, we had uh, some some information and data in here from uh, uh, Jade Liska Leslie Mix and Melissa Cooper and some other fine folks at Aviation Department that have provided some data and then also Matt Maurer is here and there was uh, also some information provided by the fire department because we wanted to assess some of the city's impacts just from there's th this big this bridge issue is bigger than just the airport and access to the Northland and Southland. This, this does involve some life safety issues. So with that, um, since I am an engineer with some, some business background, I'm just going to get straight into the data and facts. Um, we will kind of talk about uh, the uh, study that we're doing, the condition of the bridge, and then the issues that uh, or choices that, uh, that kind of need to be made. So with that, I'm going to go over to uh, the next slide, which says, what is the Pell? You'll hear the term PEL, P-E-L, a lot. That stands for Planning and Environmental Linkages. And what that is is it's a, a federal highway uh, process where and different sorts of uh, agencies can use this as an effort to integrate the planning on the front end. In the past, um, transportation projects generally, 
the uh, state DOT or a city agency would decide we're going to do something. They would do an environmental impact statement or an environmental assessment. They'd spend a bunch of money, do a lot of work, and then they would go out and get public, public comment. This is kind of the opposite. We have been very front end on our public involvement. We've had a public meeting at the downtown library about six, eight weeks ago where we had about 200 folks. We've also got the website. Um, I'll point that out. It'll be in the bottom of some of the, some of the other slides, but anyone that's watching online or watching this later, the website for the study is www.beyondtheloopkc.com. So we encourage folks to sign up there and engage just so that we have uh, information that we can get out. So the uh, study, the Pell study was decided because in 2014 when MoDOT was getting ready to do its Amendment 7 process, they had this project listed as a replacement of a new structure. And so uh, it was going to focus on the O'Neill Bridge and I-70 downtown and those connections. It was going to look at alternatives and what we needed in this area. It was going to develop what's called a purpose and need. In any sort of federal environmental process, you need to develop what your purpose and need is because you want to determine that any of your solutions that you come up with meet the definition of what you're trying to solve. So if we had a purpose and need of saying we want to build a eight-lane bridge to um, – you know, add bike ped, that doesn't really make sense because you wouldn't build a wider bridge if you just wanted to add bike ped accommodations. It also was going to look at a bunch of alternatives. It was not going to come up with a recommendation, but part of that study um, was going to just basically develop an a la carte uh, listing of what could be done and what those costs were. The thing, uh, and then develop that implementation plan, so again, so that we could report back and say that if we wanted to do X, it cost Y dollars. If we wanted to do Z, it cost, you know, uh, a dollars. The uh, big things we're going to look at is, uh, you know, West Bottoms access uh, to the interstate system is uh, rather, rather not easy, and so we wanted to see about what we could do to increase access to the Port of Kansas City. We wanted to look at the access to and impacts to the airspace around the Charles Wheeler downtown airport. We also needed to be concerned about the Missouri River accommodation. Uh, and then also, lastly, you know, if you've been across the bridge, you've seen folks that have been walking on that two or four foot wide metal grate where you can see down to the river. We do need to have some sort of bicycle pedestrian accommodation across the river because we do have folks that use it on a daily basis. The impacts to, to transit and railroads, uh, that's going to take up a lot of time. And then also KDOT had plans to do improvements to Lewis and Clark Viaduct in downtown KCK. So what we wanted to do was look at all those things, and these were our goals to improve. And all this infrastructure was built before 1960. And so the big arching question that the study wanted to answer is, do we double down on what we have, or do we maybe do something different given that the world has changed since then? The uh, Pell study area, you, what you see is uh, – the study area is basically focuses on that kind of blue, it looks like the Grinch, uh, the blue Grinch area. Mm -hmm. That is where we're going to be looking at the interstate system and some of the connections uh, across. It was also going to look at the 635 and 435 uh, kind of as the limit for the traffic model. The public was going to, you know, is going to have a lot of questions about changes to the interstate system, changes to the connections. So we needed to evaluate all that out to those systems because it's a connected system. If you're going from Wichita to Des Moines, uh, you know, there's really no need for you to go through downtown if you're a semi-truck. And so that's kind of the extent of the area. It will also uh, build a pretty s intensive, data-intensive traffic model. We've done some preliminary flighting, uh, viewing and recording of data from helicopters, <coughs> and we're developing what's called an origin destination uh, public interface where folks will be able to go in and say, if I'm coming in I-35 across the Kansas state line, where am I going? And so we've recorded that data based on uh, helicopter flights and then just geoprocessing that. Uh, the uh, coordination on this has been pretty, I won't say substantial, it's uh, pretty integrated. You've got just at the study level, we've got Kansas City, Kansas, MoDOT, KDOT, uh, working together kind of as the basic study management team that's directly impacted. But then we also have a litany of acronyms at the federal level that we need to work with. We even need to work with the United States Coast Guard because the United States Coast Guard, even though we're in the middle of the country, does regulate navigation on the Missouri River. So we've got the ATA, North Kansas City, multiple Kansas City departments, our multiple regulatory area agencies, and uh, we've also got, uh, you know, a pretty substantial group of um, constituent 
folks that we're meeting from neighborhood folks, downtown neighborhoods. Uh, Danny Roder with Burns and Mac is leading that engagement, and they've had some offline informal meetings, uh, generally at uh, places that uh, young folks like to hang out after work. And so we've been doing that. We've got six different public involvement strategies for the project because we know that we need to reach people that live downtown. We need to reach people that drive through downtown. We need people that commute downtown. And so we've got multiple different things because all those folks have different needs. Recent developments. Um, the uh, MoDOTs kind of altered their plans. Uh, they, uh, they are, of course, strapped for funding, and so they have developed a uh, replacement project, and it would be a $49 million rehabilitation of the existing bridge. It has an expected lifespan of 35 years, and it is in their draft statewide transportation improvement plan, which is going through the process down, down in Jeff City. So in all likelihood, the rehabilitation will be funded so the bridge can be rehabilitated so it will not close. <coughs> the, um, but before we get that, I will say MoDOT is taking the, the right approach on this. They have a bunch of uncertainty that we're dealing with as far as a new bridge. What they do know is that they have an existing bridge that's in a condition that they do not want to close. So they've been very proactive and they've got the rehabilitation in because they do not want a total closure of that bridge any more than anyone else does. The, uh, the issue that we're having on you know, how this project competes in the Trump, you know, the, the, the off-discussed Trump infrastructure bill, I-70 is the number one impact for the state, state of Missouri. And so this project is not considered a regional statewide project, so it's going to be second fiddle to Interstate 70 and any improvements there. The uh, decision is being driven by two factors. There's, again, there's no funds for the bridge replacement, and then the recent inspection that we're going to go through here shortly shows that we have some potential near-term failure and uh, some fatigue and some scouring issues on the bridge. And again, MoDOT local staff has been great to work with, um, and they're more than happy to work with us for securing additional funding to replace it because they really don't want to own a uh, bridge that was built in the 50s even after they rehabilitate it. The uh, pictures I'm going to show you come from an inspection <coughs> that they recently did uh, for the bridge. They're pretty substantial. They required closure of, uh, I think, a couple closures on the weekend, and then they also had lane closures because they had to use the... Uh, as you can see in the thing, the uh, lift trucks to get underneath there. Expansion joints. Uh, that's the, uh, when you get on the bridge now, you'll get a substantial hump. As you can see in the ruler there, the expansion joints are, uh, they're not level. Uh, I-70 just had to recently be shut down for a day or so because of the expansion joints failing on the I-70 bridge at Rocheport and Boonville. And um, as you can see, we've got the, the expansion joints are the ones with the ruler. The butt joints are the ones that are in the upper right-hand picture, and that is just a, a joint that sticks together that doesn't move. Those are uh, on the approaches. The uh, expansion joints with the teeth that are shown, those are where the arches and the bridge come together. So in the, in the, in the intermediate, you have these, these butt joints, and as you can see in the picture right there, one of those joints has lost its steel member across, and so it's concrete straight, straight on the steel. And then you can see substantial rusting in the picture on the understructure, and again, you can't unrust something. Even if we come in and we do uh, the repair on it, you're still going to have a 60-year-old structure. These pictures here are the lower, hang lower hanger cable retainers. Those are the strands that come down from the arches and support the bridge deck. And as you can see, we've got substantial rusting there. Uh, again, anytime you throw salt and water, rains, and pigeons onto a facility that's metal, you are going to have rust. Stringer and floor beams, these are uh, on the approaches. Uh, the, the bridge has three components. It's got the main span over the river with the arches. Then on the north side, it's got the viaduct. And then on the south side, it's got the viaduct also. And so you're going to have pictures from all of them. But we have some problems on the approaches just as much as we do on the main span. And as you can see, we've got a lot of rusting in there, some holes in some of the floor beams. And then you can see the marks and the notes that they've made over time, just trying to monitor, you know, what extent that... Uh, that those metal members are starting to go bad. If you can picture it, you know, you can take a paper clip and you can fold it back and forth numerous times, but eventually that thing wears out and it will, will, will snap. And so not that I'm saying it's going to snap, but I'm just using that as an illustration of the issues that metal will face on that bridge. Here you can see these are the approach piers. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you look in the picture, the kind of the three up and down elements on the south side of the river, those piers are metal. So generally, we build bridge piers that are concrete, but in this case, they're metal. And again, they've got 60 years of rust. 
from all the salt and everything that have accumulated over there. And you can see how they're starting to show their, uh, what they call, they, the term is pack rust, and that's where they, you start to get that little thin rust between the different members. The uh, rehabilitation, the reason, one of the reasons why it's so expensive is you see the rivets in the picture. Every single one of those rivets that are impacted on a member will be taken out and somebody will have to manually come in and bolt those back by hand. And so that's a, that's a large amount of the cost in the project is just paying someone to go out there on a daily basis, pop out rivets and bolt them back. Here's an, some more pictures on the, uh, some of the bearing plates of the structures. And as you can see, we've got uh, just some fatiguing and uh, general rusting in the area. The portal frame, uh, if you've ever been underneath 4th and Broadway, we've got some, uh, they're, 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 again, they're metal beams, but they're kind of a box, a metal box. And uh, these pictures are from the inside of those boxes. And if you go underneath there right now uh, near 4th Street, you can see this pretty substantially on the outside. But again, you know, it's going to take a lot of time and money to get into each one of these elements and, and polish it off and do what we can to reduce that rust. The uh, last picture here is kind of the... Um, kind of the big one. This is the uh, center pier in the river, and it has what is uh, what's termed a scour hole. Anytime you build a bridge in a river, you're going to get scour. And uh, just to understand what scour is, if you can imagine you're at the beach and you're standing on the sand, and the wave comes in, the wave goes past your foot, and then it goes back, and then your foot kind of sinks because that sand goes away. That's what we have here. The uh, scour hole here, from the original, what what the diagram shows is the elevation of the Missouri River when it was built, and then what has been done with uh, underwater and sonar bridge survey to determine the extent of the, uh, the erosion around the pier. So we have about a 35-foot hole around that pier from when the bridge was originally built, and the engineers estimate that that, that center pier is sitting on shale, but it's only about a foot deep. And so one of the things that they need to do uh, rather quickly as part of that rehabilitation is come in and is place a bunch of large rock around that pier to stop that scouring to make sure that that pier does not get undermined. So I put up the toll bridge here, the uh, toll picture, just to kind of remind everyone what it was like when we first built it, but then also kind of transition from the bridge is in really bad shape um, just from a condition level and then to start talking about what the proposed rehabilitation is. So the proposed rehabilitation, we kind of have a drawing shown here, but the entire concrete deck would be removed, the entire bridge would be painted, all that pack rust and rivets would be replaced, and then any individual members would be uh, either taken out or reinforced with additional welding. The proposed roadway section that, that might be possible with the new deck would be four 11-foot lanes and then potentially a six-foot side path on the bridge, which again isn't much when you're going next to 50 some mile an hour traffic, but at least it would have a railing height that would be of a safe, safe limit and then you would also have the ability for uh, folks to not be walking down the center pier. One of the issues um, about this is it will require closing the bridge for two years. There's no way you can take the deck off, there's no way that you can um, do this work and take all those rivets out with traffic. Uh, the Minnesota I-35 bridge collapse, kind of, you know, that's a good example of what happens, potentially could happen if you do a bridge under, under traffic. The um, other issue on this is uh, construction would start in early 2019, so we would have approximately 18 months to, you know, if the rehabilitation went forward to make adjustments to the downtown airport operations, and then also some changes in fire and life safety access, because the uh, bridge is, uh, you know, it's going to be very hard to provide fire safety, life safety services just to the area of the Harlem and then also the plant. This, uh, again, it's got the sidewalk on there. Uh, and it would be in MoDOT's plan, so is, in all likelihood this would happen. The, uh, the issues of that short-term impact, I don't know how many folks uh, remember, but in the early 2000s, um, MoDOT went to paint the bridge gray because it was green and it took about three years and the contractor went out of business because they only closed it down to one lane and it took forever and uh, they eventually ended up closing the bridge to finish it off because it, it's just very hard to do. The uh, local commuter traffic would be disrupted, uh, you know, unquantifiable. You can't really put a number on it. There's about 42,000 cars a day, but how many of those trips are discretionary? How many of those are folks that are south of the river going to Briarcliff 
to uh, do stuff up there. How many folks are coming from north of the river or outside the region heading to the Power and Light District or to an event at the Sprint Center or Crown Center or the World War I Museum or any sort of our amenities. The uh, impact to the Wheeler Airport, we've got uh, a, you know, a major inconvenience to the airport tenants. They would essentially have to drive north up to the Briarcliff area and then double back down through North Kansas City on Burlington with its stoplights, or they would have to go over to Kansas on 635 and make their way back. It would reduce the uh, usage of the new customs facility that we've spent some money putting on the uh, west side of the airport. It will restrict access to the airline and TWA history museums, and then also it will cause issues with the Sprint Center with anybody that's coming in to perform at the center or uh, you know any sort of kind of corporate folks that are coming in that need to get there. It will require some, may require some update upgrades to the airport fire station. If we don't have that bridge and we can't serve Harlem, we're going to have to have life safety service picked up from the airport fire station, and, and, and it's a pretty tight facility, and so you're looking at some capital investments and uh, financial uh, costs to add additional staff there. We also have some... Uh, some pretty substantial time-sensitive delays to Children's Mercy and Midwest Oregon transplant flights. Um, uh, what I'm going to do here is, again, I'm going to read off some just some information the aviation and, and fire department provided, but Kansas City Area uh, Aviation Department and the uh, T-Hanger tenants have about 175 employees and customers. <laughs> about 75% of those come from the south. Signature Flight Support has about 300 employees and customers, and 85% of those folks come from the south. Atlantic Aviation has 220 customers and about 80% from the south. VML currently has 650 employees and about 82% come from the south, but they are also expanding their space up there and consolidating their national uh, headquarters in that area, and so they'll be moving a lot of folks into that. They, uh, they, we've met with them individually because they are a key, you know, valued uh, partner with the city, and they have a concern because if they're in a competitive industry and they're trying to attract talent, uh, their uh, employees will have to drive by some of their competitors to get to the bridge. And so there's a concern about retention and being able to keep qualified staff and, 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 and their clients there. As far as the, the actual airport, um, you know, fiscal year operating revenue at the downtown airport was about $4.2 million. It was 3.7 in 2012. So we've seen a substantial increase in percentage-wise there. And then in 2012, MoDOT Connect, conducted an economic study of Missouri airports, and during the study, the uh, Wheeler Airport was indicated to have a total payroll of about $29 million and an output of about $84 million. This, uh, the tower, the tower operations, the counts were last year, they had 78,784 flights, and about, which is about 216 daily flights. The uh, museums, uh, the Airline History Museum has about 300 v visitors and volunteers a week, and they estimate about 65% of those folks come from south of the river. And then the TWA Museum has about 150 visitors a week, and again, most of those come from, from the south. Uh, skipping down, Children's Mercy, uh, their life flight operations, they uh, did 1,140 flights last year. So that's about three flights a day uh, of, of, of kids that are coming in via helicopter to get to the emergency room or operations there at Children's Mercy. And then Midwest Transplant Network, because it's convenient to quite a few hospitals here, they flew in 700 night flight operations with organ transplants. And uh, law enforcement-wise, currently, you know, if there was some situation uh, such as an active shooter or some sort of other issue, right now the airport police cannot handle that, but they would rely on support from downtown. And so if there were closure of the bridge, we would have some issues with KCPD being able to get folks to um, that facility to handle that. And then again, Harlem, it's still part of KCMO. There are still some folks down there and some businesses. Uh, you'd have restricted or interrupted fire ambulance service. Long-term impacts. Um, from a commuter standpoint, uh, which would be myself, uh, this would not improve your congestion you have in the morning in the a.m. or p.m. So we continue to have multiple cars sitting on the bridge in the morning, creating you know unnecessary emissions uh, impacts to uh, the environment there. And then not only it, there, there's some there's misconceptions that this is just a Northland commuter thing, but if you go out there at five o'clock at night with the development along the I-29 corridor, the, Bri the Briarcliff area, the Riverside Horizons, and VML, you have a substantial south commute in the morning. Or I'm sorry, in the evening. Mm -hmm 
which because they're trying to get south, but everybody's trying to get north, the lights are all time for more folks going north. So those people coming south have to wait because we're giving more green time to those folks going north. It would not accommodate, you know, the expected growth in the Twin Creeks area. Uh, and then it would, uh, the Pell process that I talked about, we were talking about potentially, you know, changes to the interstate system. Any rehabilitation would make implementing any of those concepts almost impossible because we would be spending all our money replacing a bridge and not being able to do things that may improve that. With the Wheeler Airport, um, and again, this is uh, from my understanding from our folks at aviation, we have one of the few downtown airports that operates 24-7. The FAA pays for the tower. The, uh, they've always had some scrutiny of why are we paying for two towers in Kansas City. Uh, and then and the, the case that the aviation department at all has always made is you have such a corporate usage of that airport with American Century, Sprint, Cerner, and some of our other corporate partners. But then you also have those Life Flight and the Children's Mercy flights that get in and out. And so that we've always demonstrated there's a need from a, a, a public safety standpoint to keep that open 24-7. And so the FAA pays for that tower 24-7, so it's one of the few. So if operations were to be leased, they'd be under some, some scrutiny. And we also don't want to jeopardize any ability to get federal grants through the FAA for improvements to the area. This next slide shows kind of some population up north. Um, this is not just a Kansas City issue. We've, uh, this is a regional asset. It's unfortunate that it's not been higher on the region's priority list for MoDOT's needs. But you've got about 278,000 people. I, I pulled this data from the MARC website. About 166,000 are for K Kansas City. So you've got 110,000 residents north of the river that uh, would be considered users of this bridge that do not live in Kansas City. And so, we, uh, we don't think Kansas City should foot the bill, but we do think that now at this time in this uh, course in the region, Kansas City kind of needs to control its own destiny and needs to lead the conversation on some sort of regional funding opportunity for this. Challenges. Uh, as, again, as the mayor said, this is about 150, 160, 70 million dollar bridge. Right now we only have 50 and that's for the rehabilitation. So MoDOT would need about approximately 100 million dollars. Regulatory. This is one of the, uh, this is one of the, from a, from a red tape standpoint, this is one of the worst places to put a bridge. You've got uh, the FAA, you've got uh, all sorts of National Environmental Protection Act, uh, things you need to go through. You've got uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, you've got uh, just the Federal Highway, you've got railroads that have been here since, you know, the dawn of time in this area. And so that uh, NEPA compliance was probably a two to three year process. And I, I'm kind of glossing over it, and I just want to make sure that everyone understands. I'm not forgetting the public in all of this. We understand that we have folks in Columbus Park, the river market. We have folks from a historic preservation standpoint. We've got all sorts of interested stakeholders, and we're going to engage them through this Pell process. Um, but, again, I just don't want to make sure that everybody understands we are doing that. I just don't want to gloss over it, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move forward. That... Uh, NEPA process to do the initial clearances to even get the authorization to go buy right away or start final design is about a two to four million dollar cost. And MoDOT is hesitant to uh, commit to any sort of process apps at some sort of commitment because why would they spend their limited dollars on doing an environmental study for a bridge that we may never, never build? And then uh, also the condition of the existing um, structure. You know, you've seen the pictures. The bridge is in, uh, is in, it's, it's perfectly safe, otherwise MoDOT would have closed it, but we know at some point over the next two years, you know, as that's going to continue to deteriorate, it's going to become harder and harder for them to keep low, you know, they'll have to load, limit it and restrict it in number of access. But all it takes is one semi-truck coming across there and nobody catching them um, being extremely overweight and we've got, a, we've got an issue. And then uh, the, this kind of... All of this is coming together and forcing this conversation over, you know, as a region, what do we need to do in, in order to get, come up with some sort of funding option to put in the new bridge because it is a regional asset. It is right in the center of the metropolitan area. And again, um, Kansas City, you know, will benefit from it, but we are not the sole one that will use it. With that, I'll entertain any discussion. Councilman Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and let me say a big thank you to you and Councilman Wagner for uh, making sure that this is uh, before the public. You know, we, I've probably sat through four or five or six of these presentations so far, and um, 
each time it, it makes me realize how important uh, this is to our community as a connector. And so thank you all for doing it. But I, I will say also that I want to thank the members of the public who certainly have come uh, to learn <laughs> more information, whether or not they receive fake news, wrong news, or uh, whatever news you want to call it. Uh, it is important and it is our duty as elected officials to make sure that we are telling the public information that is a, that will impact them. Uh, coming at 1 o'clock in the afternoon uh, anywhere takes away, of course, from your daily schedule and your daily routine uh, where you could be somewhere else. And so to come and get information about uh, uh, something that is extremely important to us uh, really matters. So I think it's important to say thanks regardless of where you got information from or how you felt like you got here. Um, so I do want to say that as well. You know, um, you've mentioned a lot of information about this, and I think where a, certainly a misconception can come in about this, and I've said earlier in our um, TNI meeting about the Buck O'Neill Bridge and the geo bond sort of connectivity. I mean, we just passed something, and folks certainly could, I, you know, you can understand how one would say, oh, wait a minute, well, what are they going to do with this money? So perhaps if you could talk, because I know that, uh, and you, you left off, and this is probably the second time you've done that, uh, Mark, uh, who is certainly playing, playing a huge role, I believe, uh, in this uh, conversation. But can you talk about potential um, funding gaps of $50 million uh, in some of those uh, dollars that we will have to uh, make up? Where, where are we likely looking at those? Uh, because this is a state, a state issue and, and not uh, ours to really fulfill. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good point, Councilman Reed. When it comes to funding, it seems like everything we built that's been substantial has had money from all sorts of different pots. Uh, no one can 100% fund anything anymore. That's why you see a lot of, you know, TIF, TDD, other joint projects with other municipalities. Mark, uh, through the Mid-America the Mid -America Regional Council, about every two years has what's called their Surface Transportation Program Funding uh, Grant Process, which is a certain amount of money that MoDOT gets through the Federal Highway Bill that they pass down to the cities. And so different cities submit grant requests, and it's about a, th it varies. It's anywhere between 35 to $50 million every two years or so, and that's for the entire region. And so one of the options that, uh, you know, that we would probably explore if this is kind of the, the you know, the, the resolution that Councilman Wagner has drafted is basically asking us to look at that and provide that information back to you. But we see that as being a potential funding source. Um, we've been meeting with our local and national elected officials, uh, Congressman uh, Graves, Congressman Cleaver, Senator McCaskill, Senator Blunt, to see what sort of option. A uh, $100 million ask from the federal government in this time is kind of a, it's, I think it's going to be a little hard to do. You know, Senator Bond, even though he was back in the old days of earmarks and chairing the committee at the time, only was able to get $50 million for the new Bond Bridge. So I think what it's going to be, it's going to be a, a it's going to have to be a kind of a, it, it's, it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation over at Mark. But again, I think Kansas City needs to be uh, in a position to lead that conversation since we are the biggest uh, city in the region and we are generating a lot of the economic activity here we uh, we don't want to we don't want to look at that solely as our only funding spot but we feel that if you know when the the bond bridge came together with the 50 million dollars everything kind of seemed to come in place the city contributed 10 million dollars for improvements to front street and a few other things and so uh, that's what that's the the tough decisions and the things that we'll we'll need to be looking at over the next 60 days is what are the options and then reporting back to you to determine what are you comfortable with and which way would you like us to go yeah, and, I, and i think that's the biggest point to make out is because again and i can uh, imagine where a source of confusion could come in at about uh, what are the options. What you just stated, of course, about how we're looking at ways uh, to figure out, along with our other partners. Uh, I serve on the uh, Mid-America Regional Council uh, Board, and we were having this discussion just last month uh, about what are some options, and every one of the stakeholders around the table uh, were, um, they, they were trying to do everything they, they could, and they can, excuse me, um, to figure out what are some funding options for this. Uh, rehabilitation or a new bridge, is, is it has to happen. And I can tell you, uh, as a larger sort of point that I would like to make, and I'll uh, stop there, 
uh, Mr. Mayor, is that uh, the emotional attachment to the bridge uh, with the new name of the bridge of Buck, Buck O'Neill uh, carries a little bit more uh, sentimental value, certainly for uh, me and a number of members of our community uh, with the naming of it. Um, you know, when my grandmother calls and says something about uh, what's happening at City Hall when she barely knows what's going on, uh, but says, well, what's happening with the state and City Hall and the Buck O'Neill Bridge? Why would they put uh, Buck O'Neill's name on this bridge and now they've got to close it? You know, and for me, have to explain to her and also many people who've called my office uh, with the very same question about, you know, how we're looking at uh, moving forward and not wanting to have it closed, even for the period of two years, potentially, uh, that you've outlined is extremely important. Uh, so fate, for the sake of... Uh, Buck O'Neill, who lives on in our minds and uh, legacy in Kansas City for a very long time, we've got to do what we can uh, to make sure that we uh, save the bridge. Thank you, Councilman Reed. <coughs> Councilman Lucas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mender, for the uh, presentation. Uh, just a few quick questions. Have we conducted, uh, and I'm sure you've done this level of work, but a traffic study relating to bridge closure and looking at the other nearby bridges, Art of America, Kit Bond, and then the Fairfax Bridge, I guess, in Kansas. Um, I understand the significant cost to people uh, at the Wheeler Downtown Airport and companies that are there, but as we understand the conversations relates to further parts of Kansas City North, Riverside, the second district of this city, and others, kind of the short question is, is there a significant material impact to them, or are the other bridges sufficient, perhaps, to carry at least some of that uh, traffic burden that might exist? Um, yeah, that's a good question. When we do this dynamic traffic model that we're doing, we're doing it under existing conditions. So we will we will build the big fancy computer thing, and then we'll see what it spits out. And then they do what they call calibration, where they'll look at the numbers and then actually go to a real count and try to line it up. So we will have that, and we will be able to do that. We do know that when the uh, during the 2005, during the old Paseo Bridge closer, when it was closed and painted and redecked, there were some trips that just disappeared. They just didn't happen. There were folks that decided we're just we're just not going to cross the river. We're going to avoid it. So you will see some some of that, and that's where I we make the comment that we're concerned about those discretionary trips. But we will be able to see you know what those impacts are during the. Uh, the 2005 closure on North Burlington and North Kansas City, the ATA actually uh, eliminated the parking along the street on North Burlington, and they turned those into bus-only lanes, and they actually put in a bus-only signal because at one spot, the shoulder disappeared. And so the bus would get the green time first and was able to go through. And so there was some congestion mitigation things that could have been done to mitigate it. The only issue with that is, again, that, that the – the airport operations, you know, the direct ones, you know, when the, when the north in 2012, when the north part of the Broadway extension was closed, when MoDOT was rebuilding that, at least you had the bridge to get across the river and you could get across, hop on the highway and then go somewhere else. But we will know that information. And so we'll be able to report back and because that's going to be one of the conversations of, you know, how much pain is the region willing to take, you know, or is the region willing to take, you know, an extra 15 minutes for two years, you know, to, to get anywhere. Or are they willing to maybe look at additional funding sources to reduce that to allow that to happen? So that's where those are some of the hard decisions we're going to have to take a look at, but we will have that data to be able to provide that. And I don't know if this is in your purview, um, but in connection with the conversations with the state of Missouri, I understand the discussion you've had with MoDOT suggesting $49, $50 million is their limit. Have either our, I guess, our, our city-funded lobbyists in Jefferson City or others tried to explore alternative means from the state of Missouri seeking funding? Yes, we, we actually have uh, Kit Braun, Matt Roney with Kit Bowden Strategies is doing that. And then uh, we've, again, we've had our, some of our local uh, senators and representatives we've reached out to and so they're aware of it you know but in Jefferson City there's really no not much control between the state legislature and the DOT and so um, we do have uh, and uh, I'll mention him but Mr. Kelly Martin is here as a former highway commission and he has offered and volunteered to assist us with this discussion with some of his roles that he has and has had in the past. Understood. And then one final question as we have a regional discussion uh, relating to the uh, PEL program, this PEL program, uh, and this may be subject to the, the resolution that I, I sense is coming our way. Do we have kind of a timing estimate on uh, some of the other implementation plans, namely the multimodal efforts 
uh, this conversation with KDOT about the Lewis and Clark Viaduct? Kind of uh, what's our timeline there? The Pell, the Pell study is supposed to be wrapped up early next year. We're at the point now where we're kind of, we've got a draft purpose and need that we're working on that we're going to circulate to all our other public-private partners there. And then uh, the team, once we get that done, we'll start working alternatives. But we expect the Pell process to be wrapped up in early 2018. Okay, thank you. Councilman Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question kind of lends itself to, because uh, we're talking about partners and, and folks who are going to help us uh, with the, the, the plan and all of that. But can you pinpoint down for me who the, uh, what I would call the paying investors will, will be? And it, we, I know we're looking at the 50 million from, from the state. What other potential, quote, paying investors? Because when you open a business, there are a lot of times folks want to be your partner. They don't have any, any dollars to, to lend themselves to being a, a, uh, a financial partner. But So who else are we looking at? Um, during this, we would, you know, working through Mark, we'd look at, you know, Gladstone. Uh, Carol Suter is a, a former mayor, but current council lady up there is the chairman of the Mark board right now. Um, she's been pretty well vocal about... Uh, you know, finding a solution. Uh, Mayor Rose from Riverside, we've had some discussions with, but uh, we would we would work through that, you know, some of those local elected officials and then see what the opportunity is. Because if we do go down to Mark and we say we want all the MoDOT Mark STP money, that's going to be a pretty substantial, you know, ask. And so if those folks are willing to give up potential federal projects within their city because they see this as a benefit, th that would be some of their financial investment in it. Do we think that would be substantial enough to uh, kind of drop what the nut on what we would have to come up with as as a as a city? That would be the goal. Um, the city would be the funder of the last resort for many sort of negotiations that we would have. Um, we would we would we would want our our money to be the last one in the in the process because we would expect that if we go through this effort, we would expect the state of Missouri to throw in some more funding to get the job done. Plus, also more handle. than the fifty million. Yes. And how likely is, is that if in this environment that we're in? Um, generally, uh, again, when you, nobody really wants to throw all their money out on the table first, but we've done, you know, we've done improvements. Uh, uh, the Route 210 improvements that we did three years ago, we've put, um, I want to say, $3.5 million into that. And the state, we offered the $3.5 million, and the state wound up chipping in 6 and a half on that through multiple pots. There's economic development funds, potentially statewide, that we could apply for. There's... Uh, a 50-50 cost share program that MoDOT has had in the past. That's what we use for the 210 improvements. Um, when we did the 169 improvements, we uh, spent some second district, in district PIAC, but then also some um, some citywide PIAC funds, and then we had MARC STP funds, and then we also had MoDOT contributing by managing the project and paying for all the construction, inspection, and administration. So it's going to have to be that pooling of multiple resources to pull this off. In, in the naming of the, the resources you just named, three of those resources were still city dollars, PIAC and district citywide. Correct. So uh, I'm, I'm just wanting to make sure that we're not uh, substantially on the hook for this when it's a state-owned asset. Right. For every dollar we spend here is one less dollar we spend on a city street, yes. And that's the argument we've made on some other projects, such as, you know, the 169 interchanges and a few others. Councilwoman Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Minder, and providing a general overview of the necessity and those who will be impacted by this project. Uh, I think that's definitely uh, lends itself for this to be a regional approach to deal with it. Um, but to your comments, to my colleague's question, it sounds like Kansas City is probably going to be one of the major stakeholders. Um, in this process. That being said, um, that I just I have questions about the timing of the presentation of this. We just passed a $800 million bond issue to deal with our infrastructure needs. I don't see how this is uh, probably the largest ticket item of infrastructure needs, that, but it wasn't included in the bond package. Yeah, the uh, timing on it, you know, we scheduled this business session beforehand, but one of the issues was about four weeks ago, we were provided that study, and um, pull up the date here real quick by HDR, on March 29th. 
that was when we got the study. I, I was of the, personally, I was of the philosophy that I thought that potentially this bridge was being used like it was in Amendment 7 as kind of a poster child to um, encourage the voters to pass something. But after seeing that inspection on March 29th, uh, that's when my attitude towards the project changed because I did see the, the scour hole in the middle of the river and then the rusting and the, uh, just the general components on it. And so that's when we were made aware of the situation, and that's when uh, the discussion and acceleration of the Pell process kind of we kind of we kind of hit a pause point uh, because we thought, you know, we're at a decision point here where, you know, we either need to decide that, you know, this is something that we want to move forward as a region or we just stop what we're doing, rehab the bridge and we walk away and this is the way it's going to be for the next 60 years. Well, um, you mentioned or it's come up at some point about the bond bridge and that was a bridge that the state did manage that process. It was about $245 million. Um, that was invested in that project, and the state led it. They did a great job. It was a great economic development um, tool. A number of people went to work, a lot of businesses. Um, so it was successful as the state led that initiative. Why are we taking a different approach considering the Broadway Bridge? Um, I-35 and I-29, it it's essentially comes down to when MoDOT uh, three years ago did their 325 program where they said we only have $325 million to spend, we were only going to spend it on these routes. And so this project was not on that list because it wasn't an interstate. It wasn't considered regionally significant to the state. And so MoDOT couldn't even do any planning or study and scoping on it, and that's why the city took the lead on starting this Pell process because MoDOT had a policy that they were not going to spend any money on projects and roads that were not on that 325 plan. But then you have the Broadway Bridge is 169, which is a state road, right? Correct. And then not even maybe a half a mile to the east of that is nine highway so you have another connector but with the broad with the kid bond bridge they were able to keep that open during the three years that they rebuilt that bridge so what is different with this project they built that, was a, that was a that was a new bridge that was built right but that but yeah. it stayed open you didn't close the the connector during that time period That's right and this one wouldn't be closed either if we were building a new bridge right so, I mean, but again, the state led it, they built a new bridge, they kept it open, but in this instance, we're, the presentation is, well, in order to keep it open, we really need to lead as a city and take a regional approach to it. So I'm just trying to gain a really clear understanding about why we are looking to take first position on this project when the state has demonstrated its ability to lead and do a good job on other projects. Wes, can I say something on this? More than a year ago, I think it was more than a year ago, we had a meeting with MoDOT, and they came and said, look, we have no money. We're not going to have any money. We're not being funded for anything, and any money that we have, we're only using to maintain what we've got or fix the critical things. We've got no money. Broadway Bridge wasn't on the radar at that point in time for a rehab or for closure or for a new bridge. We recognized that. And we said at that point in time, that's when we started talking about they're not going to have any money to do anything. We're going to have to do something on our own. So we knew a long time ago that they had no money and they're projecting not to have any money. And I would tell you that down the road, the way that the budgets are falling out and the deficits in the state budget, they're going to have even less money. They can't find money to do just about anything. So this was not some, this was not some nefarious deal. Uh, it's a matter of circumstance. It's a matter of financial circumstance. Uh, part two of that is this has nothing to do with the bond issue, although at least when, when the manager and I were out, we talked about this as a probable issue that was going to come up and that this bridge was key and vital. Uh, and the state is ready, willing, and able to spend their $49 million, and we don't have to involve ourselves in the conversation if we choose to let them rehab the bridge and close it. Closing the bridge for two years is the least acceptable option we have because that is the main artery into our downtown business area, and it will suffer greatly during that two-year time frame both ways, going people going from north to south and people going from south to north. That's a critical bridge. So as we started saying, how do we avoid this two-year mess that would have some fairly serious consequences, the idea of we could conceivably build another bridge. How, do, how much is that going to cost? About $150, $60 million. Where the heck does that money come from? You guys got 50. So over the last two weeks, I've heard at least 
three different proposed permutations of how this gets financed, and in just about all of them, we're the lowest dollar amount. Mm -hmm. um, there's all sorts of different pockets this money can come from. They have to be explored, and they're not, we're not even into the full exploration of those pockets yet. But we are probably, if we want to build a new bridge, then we're going to be a player in that in some financial way. Um, but we will probably not be as big of a player as just about anybody else. If we want to simply rehab the bridge and close it for two years and take our lumps that way, we don't have to spend any money except to rehab the fire station and do all the other stuff in terms of personnel <clears throat> and hope that Children's Mercy doesn't have anything that's really serious and people don't die because they're not getting transplants in time. Other than that, we're good. So we, we're, we're left with bad choices on both sides. But uh, this is not something that uh, is, is a city-led discussion. This is a discussion that was started outside of the city that we are now playing a major role in. Mm -hmm. We have to. Thank you for that response, Mr. Mayor. I'll continue my questions. So to the point that we are having to deal with the, um, the folks that are going to be impacted. You mentioned Gladstone. You mentioned Riverside. Obviously, their, you know, their budgets are a lot smaller than what the cities would be. Uh, has there been any conversation about um, if the state maintained a leadership role in doing this, because, and I'll just be very candid, we just had a presentation less than a month ago about how the city has failed to maintain our infrastructure assets. We have roads and bridges within the city limits that the state has no responsibility in that we haven't maintained. Blue River Road, where people, we have seniors in that area where emergency vehicles have a hard time getting to. Those are our priorities, and we issued a bond to, in order to address those needs because they had not rose to the level of city priorities in a citywide plan. And so now we're saying, well, because the state hasn't done a good job, we're going to take the lead and solve that problem. I don't know that we really have the ability to do that effectively when, we, when the bond issue we issued does not adequately address all the infrastructure needs we have in the city. So whether it's $30 million or $50 million, where are those dollars going to come from within the city's budget to be able to address those needs? Again, Councilwoman, that's why we have the resolution, because right now, you know, we as staff, you know, don't feel comfortable in going out and negotiating or, you know, doing that. If, if the decision is to not do that, then we won't do that. But the, the point of the resolution and the discussion today was direction on is this something we want to move forward with or not. And so that's where, that's kind of where we stand from my perspective. Mm -hmm. my, my supervisor may have something else to say. but. Okay. Hey, anybody else? Councilwoman Mayor, Shields. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I think I share some of the concerns that I heard my colleague to the left state and uh, call, uh, Councilwoman Kennedy. Um, this is a state asset. And at least when I went out and talked to voters, I talked to them about the rundown and failed condition of city assets. And my pledge to them was that we would at least be able with these dollars to rebuild every major arterial road north and south of the river if they approved these bonds, which they then very generously did. And so to me what this means is that depending on whether it's 30 million or 50 million, that maybe North Oak Traffic Way doesn't get built, which has a price tag, I think, rebuilt, which has a price tag, I think, of $15 million. Uh, that maybe North Brighton doesn't get finished, and I don't know, maybe you, my colleague could tell me what the price tag is on it to extend it so it's a safer uh -huh. uh, facility roadway than it is now. Uh, Vivian Road, if you drive across it, probably needs to be rebuilt, and I don't know the price tag on it. I mean, just in the Northland alone, there are significant dollars of existing city arterial roads that need to be rebuilt. At this point, basically, the study that the city had done about a year ago that we've gotten the results on, just generally on the condition of pavement, basically about 50 percent of our roads are in good are in fair to good condition, and about 50% of our roads are in poor to failed condition. 
if we don't invest over the next few years a sizable amount of dollars in those particularly arterial roads, we're going to end up where 80% of our roads are in poor to failed condition. So I think that's the concern and maybe there's no money, more money to be gotten out of the state, I don't know. But I think if the state thinks that we're going to step in and pick up a sizable portion of this, that then there's going to be less inclination on the part of the state to do what they ought to be doing, which is maintaining the assets that are under their control and are their responsibility. So I think that's just the continuing concern that I have. I mean, if we're going to start rehabbing or replacing state assets, then this $800 million is going to be gone very quickly. And we're not going to have done what I think we committed to our citizens, which is rebuild our existing infrastructure. So, Councilman Wagner. If, if there's no one else. Oh, um, sorry. I'll, I'll just be quick. Um, the two things in, I haven't seen the resolution yet, but I think that would be incredibly helpful to us, perhaps even sooner than some of the others so we don't lose the uh, answers to some of the issues, is one, really that, uh, that traffic impact uh, summary issue. I, I find that to be more persuasive than anything. We, I, I, while I understand there are important institutions on both sides of the river, I really do want to know if having someone fly in a downtown airport and then transfer over the Heart of America Bridge to Children's Mercy is 20 minutes longer and means a loss of life or if it's 30 seconds longer. Knowing the material impact of this will be helpful and I frankly think should be in some ways a prevailing consideration since we're talking about a roughly $100 million kind of difference with what may be done. One other point that I think uh, lobbying kind of to Councilman Barnes' point uh, we never know what the culture or the feeling of Jefferson City will be. I know uh, former State Senator Justice could note that. I, I would like us in our legislative priorities, and perhaps this is for legislative committee, to ensure that having the state uh, or lobbying the state to have as many funds possible expended on this effort uh, is key. Because I guess the easiest way to have the regional conversation is we get our state reps, our governor, and others to say that this is an important asset for the people of western Missouri, and perhaps we can find uh, some sufficient funds that way. I understand Jeff City is a hard place to do business, but I would imagine this should be near the top of our legislative priorities uh, at the, in Jefferson City this year. That's Councilwoman Kennedy. I, I, to your point, Councilman Lucas, I mean, you're right. This is a, we're talking about coming up with a plan to spend money as a region, well, we don't really have a good sense right now, uh, as far as legislative wise, um, what the appetite is in Jefferson City for them to fund this. Other than them saying they have no money, and they say that to us on everything, they don't have any money. But as the mayor said, we knew a year ago they didn't have any money, and we may be asked to contribute to this. We did not bring this forward prior to the bond issue to seek an opportunity for us to fund that. And then post bond approval, now we're trying to find a way to, to fund this. And I understand the mayor's point that there's not a commitment of any dollars, but any dollars that's committed to this are infrastructure dollars that will be taken from something else. And so I, I, um, while I appreciate Councilman Wagner's uh, focus and attention on this, um, the timing is a little off and after the fact. And for us to find a way to fund this without going to the state and forcing them to find a way to fund this or, or provide some additional commitment or put some pressure on this, it puts us on the hook. And so we come to the table and say, oh, well, we can carve some money out here to do that. Well, then where's the pressure or responsibility on them to maintain their asset? I mean, I just, I, I don't know that this is the, the right timing or approach to do this without them really coming up with doing what they've done in other areas of the state consistently, which is doing good road and bridge projects um, and maintaining assets they currently control. So I, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that having the manager go out and, and come up with a plan of funding strategy that puts us on the hook gets us closer to getting them to do what they're supposed to do at the state level. Let me, let me, let me, let me just get to this whole thing. We've been talking to the state legislature ever since MoDOC came and told us that they had no money about money. And this idea that they're doing this in other parts of the state is erroneous. They're not doing anything in any other parts of the state. When they came and told us they had $300 million and how they were going to spend it, that's how they spent it. 
I have a group of mayors that I meet with on quarterly. We meet in Jefferson City. Every single mayor from around this entire state is having exactly the same problem, and it's all about infrastructure. We met with the House and the Senate Infrastructure and Transportation Committees. They couldn't agree on where to go to have lunch, and they got into a big <laughs> argument about who was responsible for what and whether or not we could toll it. We talked about pulling a toll bridge on this bridge so that we wouldn't have to be on the hook. We could do a public-private partnership. Then they passed the legislation that says you can't toll anything in the state. So this conversation, as far as recognizing what MoDOT said a year ago, has been ongoing. Get in, and we can't force the Missouri State Legislature to do anything. We're way, way ahead of the curve here. Everybody's talking like we've made some commitment to do something. What we have talked about is these are our options, and if we choose option A, what's the consequence? If we choose option B, what's the consequence? No decisions have been made. However, we did pass a bond issue for roads, streets, sidewalks, and bridges. This is a major, major bridge that has huge economic impact on this city, and we can't ignore it. And the bottom line is, if we find out that the bridge is going to fall in tomorrow, we can say it's the state's fault and they should fix it, and everybody that's on the bridge can just fall in with it, or we can do something to try to save it because we have a responsibility to it. This is the main artery in and out of downtown Kansas City where most people work. And it is a huge economic issue. So before we get too far down the road and talking about it, I think it would behoove us to work through the situation some, get all the facts on the table, find out what our options are, and then make a decision without already br logging in on a specific point without having all the facts. Right. Because right now, we simply don't know. What we know is what we found out through MoDOT when they basically announced it to the world. They didn't tell us. They went out and did it in public, went to the newspaper and said, hey, we got a problem with the bridge. And then it was like everybody's been scrambling since. Okay. But, you know, we can slow this whole thing down. This is informational only. No decisions have been made, but we need to do our due diligence and get the facts on the table so that we can make a decision that makes sense. And it's going to be a hard decision either way. Because I can tell you, the concept of closing that bridge for two years, not good. It has all sorts of long-range and short-range financial implications for this city. Go ahead. Um, if, if I can close it, because I know we've got a closed session. Um, I'll remind everyone that a few months ago, we had a surprise closure of Grand Boulevard. And it wasn't because it had fallen in yet, but it was because structurally the engineers looked at it and said, this will fail. And all of a sudden, it was closed. And it failed because there was a major truck that went over it. Exactly. And so what I'm suggesting is I, I, I uh, apologize for the timing, but I have no control over a failure of a bridge. Um, but it seems to me that even on a small scale with Grand, you had major inconveniences, major work that had to be done. This is, this is 50 times that. And to out of hand suggest that, eh, we really don't have to do anything, I think is a mistake. MoDOT has made it clear what they will do. They will just simply rebuild the bridge. And rehab it. And rehab it. Um, and I think what I'm suggesting through the resolution that's now before you and hopefully will be, be on first reading today uh, is to suggest you have a choice. You can either let them rehab it or you can do something else. But we can't define what the something else is until we've given some direction to actually investigate it. What we have here, unfortunately, is because of MoDOT's move, the process that Mark has gone through has to be accelerated. And it has to be accelerated because in order to show if we do have interest in a new bridge, that MoDOT will, will, will help us along, is we have to go through the environmental prop process, that NEPA that Wes mentioned earlier. We have to start that process probably in three or four months in order to go through the two years that it'll take to get that part done. And if we don't, and if we don't do that, then I will tell you, we will get a rehab of the bridge, and that's what will, that's what will occur. 
Um, I, I am very nervous, though, when it is suggested in the line of questioning that it's either or. Either you do what was in the GEO bond or you do the bridge. And what I think I would suggest to all of you that reserve that judgment until you get 60 days after this resolution passes to see if that is indeed your choice because I will suggest to you that it is not. That you can still do the list that we have said and I've been to every part of this city for that election. You were kind enough to say that. I think I found a but few phone booths as yeah. well. No, you were. You, so, you were and, everywhere. And I, have, and I have projects in the first district that I want to get done. I do not want to have to take geo bond money to get a new bridge. So I have just as much interest in not having to make that choice as everybody else here and everybody else in the audience. But until you know our options, how can you say you don't want to do the bridge? I don't know. Well, but I want to give them the opportunity and the chance to come back to give you an informed decision as to how financing may occur. The reality is that MoDOT has said what they will do as a state-led project. And if that's good enough for us, okay. But there are issues if that is our choice. We may have another choice. The resolution allows us to begin that conversation. And it will have to be quick because the clock's ticking. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Councilwoman Shields, do you have something? No, I think I'm fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilwoman Kennedy. To, to Mayor Pro Tem's point that whatever we need to do ha needs to be quick, I mean, indicates that this is not a new conversation. The mayor said this started over a year ago. I think it would have been helpful to this council and to the citizenry of Kansas City for us to have had some of this information prior to the bond passage. We provided Amendment A as a guideline that we were going to utilize on how the funds were going to be allocated. And now, two weeks later, we're directing the manager to find another way to fund another major project. And the mayor started this meeting with to the tune of $30 million. I don't know where $30 million is going to come from. And unless you guys have had that conversation already, the mayor said make sure we make a decision based upon facts. Clearly, they have facts and information that, that I don't have as a council person that I would like to have information about um, on how we got this, this conversation. Well, if I may, what was the date that MoDOT released, the, released their closure plan for the... For the, um, uh, uh, the report was dated March 29th, but it was a week or so before then, I don't recall. So, and we, we, passed, we learned in the newspaper. So thank you for that. The date we passed our uh, resolution to put questions one, two, and three on the ballot was January 16th. 16th. That is why we have this conversation now. It is not what I, frankly, I am interpreting as a bait and switch that we're trying to perpetrate on people. The reality is nothing mattered until March when MoDOT said, here's what we're going to do. Well, M Mr. And they didn't come to us. They well, put it out in the paper. If exactly. I may finish, Go ahead. because he responded, and you characterize it how you want. I'm just stating facts. The facts are two weeks after the election, we have a resolution to direct the manager to find a way to pay for a major project. Now, when MoDOT put their information out, I don't know, but the mayor said they knew a year ago. No, no they, I didn't say that. No. You said a year ago they we had said a discussion they, about how little money they had and how they were going to spend it on doing basic maintenance. Broadway Bridge, which it was named at the time, never came up in that conversation never happened. They were talking specifically about I-70 and those types of projects because they were having that conversation because the tax initiatives that they had tried to pass in order to fix I-70, which has been the total focus of MoDOT, frankly, for the last few years, did not pass and they didn't have any money. So we were talking about I-70. They wanted to know whether or not we would be able and willing to take over the maintenance of the exit ramps off of I-70 so that they could save money to do other stuff. And our answer was uh, no. So it had nothing to do with the Broadway Bridge. It had to do with MoDOT's bad budget, and that was where it stopped. So at what point does Broadway Bridge now, so as of the March announcement from the state that this needs to, to happen, where the question becomes repair or replace? At what point did that conversation emerge amongst you and the Mark Board or... After we heard about it in the newspaper. Yeah, March Same 25th. So now that we're at this juncture where the conversation is, now we jump to we got to do something quick and the city should take the lead. 
what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that I'm not inferring that there's anything nefarious or if there was a keep away, but we've gone from knowing the state didn't have any money. Now the Broadway Bridge has major, major repair needs. At some point, somebody doesn't like the state's options. We need something different than that, but the city wants to take the lead on that. Now we just committed to our citizens that we're going to finally address our infrastructure needs that we've ignored. But now we're going to take the lead on a major bridge repair replacement project is what is being suggested. No, what's being suggested is if all we want is a simple replacement, the state will take the lead. They will shut the bridge down for two years. The issues that Mr. Minder has brought up in his presentation will occur. And if we're fine with that, there you go. If, on the other hand, it is desirable to not have that length of closure and that you want better operability along that, that area, then the city will have to come forward because the alternative simply will be the state will, will do what they said they will do. Repla re renovate what you've got and that'll be that. And so in my mind, you know, if this resolution were to pass, and we can, we'll talk about it again, I presume, in transportation and infrastructure next week, if this resolution passes, then 60 days afterward, the manager will come back and he will say, here are your various funding options. And at that point, you can say, I don't like any of them. Go ahead and replace the bridge. However, if you don't pass the resolution and there is no direction for us to do anything, then you've already made your choice, and that is a renovation of the current bridge, which will occur in, a, in three or four years. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm puzzled to have the, the entire debate today yeah. because <laughs> yeah. we're asking for more work. Yeah. We're, we're really just trying to get all of the facts and the options on the table so that the decision can be made. It's just that simple. Well, the question today is because we have a discussion in business session, the presentation to the council, this is our opportunity to ask those questions. But the questions, the, this presentation was made a week ago in work session. Actually, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago in work session. We had exactly the same presentation two weeks ago in work session. But again, this is the opportunity for council to ask questions. We could ask questions two weeks ago. And I can ask them today. You sure can. <laughs> Just like but, you asked them last you week keep, in the presentation about the community imply, benefits agreement. You keep trying to imply that today is the first time that you've ever heard of this. You we said, had this discussion Mr. two Mayor, weeks ago. I can replay this conversation last week when you, your, your staff was in a, in a meeting for the past year on a presentation, and you said it was the first you heard about it. This is the first I've heard about it. You ask questions, I'm asking questions. <laughs> I don't like the fact that there's an annoyance of asking questions. Everybody that came here down here today, they want to know the same questions I'm asking. So to assume that I'm asking on my behalf, you, you can do that, but I'm asking to get on the record to clarify to people who are watching and who are in this audience, what are we doing? Because to someone who does not have the information that you have, two weeks after we passed the bond issue to direct an action to do something else, it is questionable. So I'm giving the opportunity to clear the air on what that may be, uh, and this is the proper form for that to occur. So I appreciate the responses I've received today. I appreciate the people who've come here today to ask questions. I don't know if they'll get an opportunity to have their questions answered, um, but I, I had a list of them, and I appreciate the responses I've received so far. Good. Anybody else? I, Go ahead. I'd just say... Uh, I don't think any of the conversation today is about today we want to choose the state just spending $50 million. I think what the discussion about today is a statement, at least by some of the people on the council, that we're very hesitant to invest any of the $800 million property tax funds on a state asset. If the city manager can come up with a plan and a way to replace this bridge that does not include that, then or then I think everybody here is going to be very excited and interested in that. And I I plan to probably vote for this resolution, hopefully with a caveat saying that we're going to look for sources and a, and a plan that's outside the $800 million bonds. I think we're all open to see what the options are. I think we want to reserve the $800 million for city-owned assets and the maintenance of them. Was it you or Lucas? You, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, um, I appreciate the conversation that we've had today about this issue. 
couple of points that I'll make, and I think that uh, Councilwoman Shields has certainly made a couple of points that I wanted to make. Uh, but one is, let's not try to treat this as doomsday. Uh, we have an opportunity to move forward to uh, protect um, an asset that is a major community connector in this city, being the Buck O'Neill Bridge. We don't want this conversation to be uh, what our old friend uh, Sarah Palin said, a bridge to nowhere. Or did she say that? <laughs> no, I think she said she could see Russia from her backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever said that. She said that too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> said a lot of stuff. So, so let's, let's, you know, we, we have an option, and I think, uh, and this may be out of order, Mr. Mayor, but the resolution which was strategically placed in front of us at the appropriate time here, uh, which we will have an opportunity to discuss next week in transportation and infrastructure, 845 uh, a.m. Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, 26th floor at a city council chamber in the People's Building, City Hall. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, Section 1 in the Be It Resolved talks about working with our partners. Section 2 talks about the 60 days and, you know, coming up with those uh, regional funding strategies to build a new, uh, you know, bridge or, or what have you. I mean, so we can work through this language uh, and have further discussion about w what we agree on or not. And I don't want to say that one option is best or not. I mean, yeah. as it's been stated, and I'm now reiterating, we don't know. Uh, there has been a lot of work put into this. Uh, and again, through my service on the uh, Mid-America Regional Council Board uh, and a number of our uh, regional partners, They've been working toward this, and so I think it's advantageous for us to work through what we think is the best language uh, for a resolution um, that we think is good. And again, as it, if it comes back, we as a council, if you can get, I think it's seven votes on some days and maybe nine votes on another day, uh, anything is possible, mm -hmm. in or not. And so I think we have to get ourselves into the position of uh, seven, nine, or um, put up or shut up, as my grandma would say. Councilwoman Hall. Well, I don't know who built this bridge to begin with, but number one, it seems like it well, hasn't been, it's not that old of a bridge. And around the country, there's a whole lot of older bridges that are still standing. And I guess my question is, if I want MoDOT to reconstruct it, I'd like to make sure they don't do it the way they did it the last time, because I think it could last longer than 50 years. Many bridges around this country, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, a lot of them have lasted longer than this. So um, what I would suggest is, don't use metal again. Use concrete. I mean, I don't, I don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. And when you say they're going to take out the bolts and put in new ones, don't do that. So use something that's going to last longer and make more sense and be more financially um, useful. So those are my three cents. Okay. Any, Councilman Lucas. Just a quick question on the study. I know we've done this a lot, and we can discuss this in T&I, and it might even merit either an additional resolution or substitute. Uh, it seems as if the real question at issue is whether we know MoDOT will repair the bridge. The issue is the two years closure. Even in the resolution language seems to presume calamitous results from two years closure, which may be accurate. But for example, in one of our recitals, we know Children's Mercy completed 1140 flight operations. A ride in the bridge will have a detrimental impact. I think almost as a condition preceding to our answer of this whole funding question, which is what the resolution's about, we really, let's fully develop the problem, the, the costs themselves. We understand there are a lot of important issues and all of that, but the traffic time differences, the, the legitimate costs, respectfully, there are other ways into downtown too. Lots of people come over the Bond Bridge each day and the heart of America. I, so I would like to, I would just like to see those costs too so that we actually have some assessment of what the problem issue is before we're, because this resolution does really just say build new bridge. So we're presuming we, we need to build br new bridge. While I certainly love the northern part of the Buck O'Neill Bridge and the areas thereafter, I just want to make sure that we've assessed the costs, the negatives that we have to address as well. I, and, and it's just one statement. Um, you know, kind of part of this as we as we enter into this, we are essentially going to enter into a negotiation with the state of Missouri. And so um, the request would be to have some sort of flexibility and everything. We don't want to we don't want to show all our cards, you know, because we want them to throw in more money, if at all possible. And all the comments that you've made, the, you know, this coming this to this business session allows us as staff to understand where you're coming from so that as we go into those discussions, we know what exactly you t you can expect so that we know back in 60 days you know the great thing about being an engineer and planning and doing all this stuff is you know you could recommend that 
we need to build mm -hmm. gondolas in Penn Valley Park. But, <laughs> you know, the answer may be no. But, you know, so having all this feedback in this forum is very helpful as far as our discussions that we're going to have over the next 60 days with the state and some of our partners. Anybody else? Okay. You want to sum up? Uh, just uh, I think uh, – We've had a great, robust discussion, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the direction uh, that we've had. I think, I hope, people understand that, um, you know, but for uh, a press conference in March by MoDOT, Mark would have continued with its, with its schedule on its study, and we'd be fine. That didn't happen. Now we're having to respond. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity, and I thank Wes and the staff that are, are here um, who have given the information that they have to Wes. Um, and finally, uh, the cost, Councilwoman Shield, um, 14 million north of Pleasant Valley Road, okay. 8 million <laughs> south of Pleasant Valley Road. Oh. So I want to get that done. Yeah, uh, and so, I'm with you on that. And I think um, with uh, some good discussion that we'll have in committee next week, we'll arrive at something that hopefully everyone will like. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Wes. Thank you.